Good morning and welcome to our morning worship service from Calvary Free Presbyterian Church, Macrofelt, Northern Ireland. We do welcome you and we pray the Lord will bless you as you meet with us. We do ask you to share the service online and let as many people know as possible about it. And certainly in that way we can get the gospel spread through our friends and our family. We want to commence with our opening hymn. And as usual, the hymns that we use in this broadcast have been previously recorded and we're going to commence with, I'm not ashamed to owe my Lord or to defend his cause, maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. No better theme to start with than the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship God together. Let's sing it out. Let's unite together in prayer. Our gracious Lord and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for the privilege of bowing before Thee this morning. We rejoice, O Lord, that Thou hast been good to Thy people. We thank Thee, Lord, for Thy mercies which are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. We approach Thee in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You for His merit and His righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that he is worthy to receive all power and glory and honor and praise. And we come before our great God this morning in the name of the Savior. And Lord, we worship thee. We do thank thee for the privilege of having these online broadcasts. We thank you, Lord, for the internet. We pray you'll watch over as the message goes out this morning that there'll be no interruptions, but rather that people will tune in and find a message for their soul. Lord, we thank thee that there are many things in this world that help us physically. But, O oh Lord, the only thing that can help us spiritually and help our soul is the precious word of God. 
revealing to us a Savior who died on the cross for sinners, shed his precious blood, that we might be redeemed and saved from our sin. We do thank thee for the gospel. And in this world of chaos, that there is something that stands sure and firm, and it is the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. We do thank thee for each one watching who's been born again of the Spirit of God. We thank you, Lord, for each blood-bought Christian. And we pray you'll bless them today. Draw us closer to thyself as we seek to worship thee. Speak to our hearts. Have a word in season. And, O oh Lord, we do pray that thou will bless us as we meet in this way. We do pray for land and we thank you, Lord, for the movement in our government toward the opening of churches again. And we pray, Lord, that you'll just bless this week with the preparations that have to be made. And we do ask thee, O oh Lord, that thou wilt give wisdom and help us, Lord, to do what is right before God and man. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless our government. We pray you'll continue to give them wisdom and direction, even at this time. We do pray for our congregation, and we thank you, Lord, for keeping us through this time. We do remember especially those who have been bereaved. Remember our own congregation here. And dear families that have lost loved ones, and we pray, O Lord, that thou wilt be so near unto them, that thy comfort and thy presence will be their testimony. We thank thee for the God of all comfort. We thank thee for the one who knows all about our weaknesses and our fears and our sorrows. And we praise thee, O Lord, that he is able to meet us at the very point of our need. And we do pray you'll bless homes today where death has entered. And Lord, just give peace to troubled hearts. We do pray, Lord, that you will save in these meetings. We pray you'll restore in these meetings, that even, Lord, through these meetings, you'll cause people to come up and make their stand for the Lord. And we do pray, Lord, that in the days that lie ahead, we'll see a great turning on to the Lord. And through the preaching of the precious word of God and through the proclamation of truth, that souls, many souls in our town and our district will be one for the Savior. And Lord, we thank you for those who over the past number of months have been watching online. And Lord, we pray that even whenever the restrictions are finally lifted and the church doors are open again, that we'll be able to see some of those people sitting on our pews and joining in with the worship of God. Bless us this morning. Do us good. Meet with us, we pray. Be glorified in thy midst, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen and amen. We're continuing to worship the Lord, and the hymn that we're going to watch now is Wounded for Me, Wounded for Me, There on the Cross He Was Wounded for Me, Gone My Transgressions, and Now I Am Free, All Because Jesus Was Wounded for Me. And that hymn goes on to say, Dying for Me, Risen for Me, Living for Me, and Praise God Coming for Me. May the Lord bless us as we listen to these precious words. Let's stand and sing. Oh 
We invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with us this morning to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6. And earlier in the year, we were studying this passage of God's Word, but we certainly want to read it again and pray the Lord will bless us as we consider these truths afresh. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse number 24. And God's word says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought of the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Amen. And we pray God out a blessing. The public reading of his word, it says there in verse 32, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, And then if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Praise God. When we go through with God, then he will meet every need that we have and his supply every need. Amen. We do want to welcome you to our service this morning. We welcome you in the Savior's precious name. And we do want to make the necessary announcements for the incoming week in the will of the Lord. The services this week will continue to be broadcast online. This evening at 7 p.m. we have our gospel evening service. Then on Tuesday at 7 p.m. we have our Bible study in the book of Philippians. Wednesday at 7 p.m. we have our children's meeting. And then Thursday at 7 p.m. we have our overview of the books of the Bible series. And we are in First Chronicles. Saturday at 8 p.m. is your youth fellowship meeting. And then next Lord's Day at 12 noon, family worship. And at 7 p.m., our gospel evening service. And we do invite you to join with us online for those meetings. We do want to express our sympathy to those who've been bereaved in recent days. And we do pray that the Lord will comfort and sustain those dear families who have known the passing of loved ones. We remember the Cain family the passing of Margaret, the Weir family and the passing of Geordie, the Brown family and the passing of Margaret from Castle Dawson, uh, the Murphy family and the passing of Sandra, the Miller family on the passing of Sylvia, and then here in her own congregation, the Wilson family on the passing of Sammy. And to Greta and family circle, we do express our sympathy and our prayers as congregation, and we are indeed praying for them and remembering them before the throne of grace in prayer. May the Lord comfort and sustain these dear families in the days that lie ahead. We also want to say congratulations to Hannah Neeson and Matthew Eccles on their wedding, which took place on Thursday, the 11th of June. Now, due to the restrictions, there could only be a limited number of people here, and it had to be outside. So it may be, I stand to be corrected, but I believe it's the first wedding that's taken place on the steps of the church. But certainly the Lord gave a very good day in a rainy week and they were able to get married in the open air. Pray for them that the Lord will bless them as they set up home together and he will lead them and guide them in the days that lie ahead. Our prayer requests for this week 
First of all, could you please remember the online ministry as it goes out throughout the week to uh, the children and to uh, the adults. Please do pray that the Lord would bring fruit in from this ministry and that even when we're able to come back, we will see new faces in our congregation who have been reached through the online broadcasts. But secondly, could you please also remember our session and our committee? Now, guidance is needed from the Lord as we consider the matters relating to the opening of the church for worship. Now, we do know that the government this week have set a provisional date for services to resume, and we praise the Lord for that and for that movement. And therefore, there's going to be further information and guidelines given this week by the government. Also, there'll be presbytery guidelines which have to be implemented. And therefore, we do pray the Lord will give us help and wisdom as those matters are taken care of properly and prayerfully. And we want to do everything to the glory of the Lord. So do remember our session and our committee at this time as we make preparation for the opening again of the doors of the house of the Lord. If anyone needs help during this week, please do get in contact. Uh, you're very welcome to do that by phone, message, Facebook Messenger, or email. The address is shown here on the screen. We do thank those who've gotten in touch from different places, once again, around the world, uh, making contact and letting us know where you're watching in from. We do appreciate that, and we welcome you, and thank you for joining with us in the Saviour's name. We do ask you to keep safe, keep looking to the Lord, keep praying, and drawing closer to him even in these days. These are announcements that make subject to the will of the Lord, and we pray the Lord will bless us even in this incoming week in his will. At this time, we are going to listen to your youth fellowship singing, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God once again and turn with us to Psalm 18. 
Uh, we're continuing our studies in the psalm. Indeed, in the book of Psalms, we're going to turn to Psalm 18 and continue from verse number 31. So let's go to verse number 31 and read the next few verses together, please. For who is God, save the Lord? Or who is a rock, save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the word of God. And as we come to ponder these few verses, we pray that the Spirit of God will shine the light of understanding upon this page, that our hearts will receive truth, and that will teach us in the way in which we ought to go, that our hearts will overflow with love and gratitude for our God and our Saviour, And for those who are not saved, that they will realize that the only hope that there is in life, in death, or in eternity is found in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our Savior be lifted up today. May men and women, boys and girls, be drawn on to him. Empty me of self and sin. Give me help with the teaching of thy truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen and amen. Now, we commence uh, in verse number 31 with this question. Who is God, save the Lord, or who is a rock, save our God? Now, we have here a very, very important question. Now, David has, in the previous 30 verses of Psalm 18, declared whom he believes to be the one true and living God. He has talked about God's deliverance, God's protection, and God's working within his life, and God's blessing within his life. And therefore, reflectively, having said all of that, David stops and asks the question, who is God other than the Lord? And the fact that the word Lord there is in capitals means that in the original, it's the word Jehovah. Who is God other than the Lord, or Jehovah? Who is a rock? So what is he asking? He's asking these questions. Who truly is God? Who is truly over all things? Who is able to do great things that man cannot do? Who is our stability when things are difficult, tempestuous, or when things change suddenly or take us by surprise? And these are important questions to consider because ultimately David is asking the question, who is worthy? of our worship and our trust. In whom and upon whom can we fully depend at all times in life and in death and in eternity? And you might say already within your heart, well, the Lord is worthy of our trust. The Lord is worthy of our worship. And friend, that's true. But if you are not saved this morning, then you do not truly believe that. You might say that God can be depended upon at all times, but if you're not saved, then you don't really believe that because you're not depending upon him. You're not trusting him. You're not worshiping him. What are some of the things that people are trusting in today rather than God? What are some of the things that people are trusting in today rather than God? Well, there are some people and they're trusting in politics and they give their lives to political endeavor and to campaigning for certain people or parties to be in power. And they believe if that party is in power, then things will work out. Things will be good. Things will be happier. Now we realize that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. We realize that when people make good decisions and godly decisions and decisions based on the authority of the word of God, then there's blessing that comes with those laws and with those decisions. But politics is not the answer to the need of the heart of man to worship and to trust in something or someone. 
Then there are different movements. And there are some people today, and they say, we're tired of the way things have been. We're tired of the status quo. And therefore, we want to start a new movement to make changes so that things will be our way. Now, let me say that there are many movements in the world today that are upright and noble, and people are campaigning for things that are God-glorifying. But there are also many campaigns today, many very uh, campaigns that are very evident and very much covered in our media today, and friend, they're not God-glorifying. You measure them up to Scripture, and you'll find they are anti-scriptural. And we need to be careful about the movements that we support and certainly about those things that we identify with. But here's the thing. No matter what the movement is, should it be a good movement or a bad movement, friend, it will do no good for your soul. It will not save you. No movement will save you. No lifestyle will save you. And we need to be very careful that we are not trusting in or depending on or living our lives in worship of a movement or an ideology. And many people are. They're giving up their time and their money and their effort to go after this ideal or this thought or this way of thinking. And that is in itself worship. But then there's some people today and they're trusting in ministers rather than the Lord. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about people who are depending upon a minister or trusting in a minister or what he says for their salvation. Some people confess their sins to their priests or to their ministers and in doing so believe that that brings uh, absolution for sin. But there are also some people sitting in churches today and their ministers telling them, as long as you go to church and be good, well, then you're on your way to heaven. And they're trusting in what their minister is saying rather than what the word of God says and rather in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever you speak to them about the gospel or about having a personal faith in Christ or just going straight to Christ to confess your sin because we don't need uh, an intermediary, they get angry. No, I've got my religion. I've got my way. And the sad reality is today, there are many people in Northern Ireland and indeed throughout this world, and they are trusting in their religion or their preacher or their pastor or their priest or whoever, whatever title you want to put on it. And they're trusting in him for their salvation, for heaven, for security. But friend, none can save other than Christ. And then there's some people and they're trusting in themselves rather than God. I have enough money to get by. I have enough wisdom to make wise decisions. I have enough health uh, to do what I want to do. And I will do what I want to do. Or I have enough righteousness to please God. I'm better than most people and surely that's okay. And friend, they're trusting in themselves. And as long as they are okay, they're happy with that. But friend, they forget that there is a sovereign God with whom we have to do. A friend, politics will fail you, movements will fail you, ministers and religion will fail you, and your own self will fail. And when all of those things fail, what do you have? Well, praise God if we're saved with Christ. David not only asks the question to that great, or asks, asks the question, but he also gives the answer. Who is a sovereign and a solid foundation? Look what it says in verse number 32. It is God. It is God. He is the only one, the one true and living God. And in verses 32 down to verse 36, we read of some of the things that God does for his people. And we'll look at those this morning. Some of the blessings that he gives to his children. And as we look at these momentarily, our hearts will be truly blessed. But let's just take that little statement. It is God. David asks, who is the one that's worthy of trust? Who is the one that we can depend upon? Who is the one that's in control of all things in the universe? It is God. Our triune God is the one who's sovereign. He is the one upon whom we can depend and place our trust. It is God that created this world by the word of his power. It is God that gives life within the womb and decrees the day of each person's death. It is God that judges all the earth. It is God that can save the sinner. It is God that calls men to be saved through his word. And as I thought about that little statement, it is God, it is God, it is God. These things are only true of God. 
There are two verses in the New Testament I just want to leave with you. Um, first of all, Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Friend, the only person who can say that you are clean, that you are right before God, that you're standing in righteousness and purity and holiness. The only person who can say that is God. The only person who can say that is God. And friend, that's something that must be, that's, that is something that can only be done when the sinner bows the knee before God and calls on the Lord for salvation. You know, if a man lives and dies in his sin, goes into a Christless eternity, it doesn't matter what the preacher says beside the coffin at the funeral in the church because the preacher cannot justify a man. Only God can justify. But then we also read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, it is God, there's a plan, and God will give you the power to live the Christian life. And some people say, I couldn't be saved because I couldn't live it. That is correct, you couldn't live it. But you can be saved because Christ lives in you. And Christ gives you the power to will and to do of his good pleasure. And that's why it's such a blessing for the Christian to say, I surrender all because the Lord will bless and give them the will and give them the ability to do his good pleasure. But here in verse 32, it says, it is God that girdeth me with strength. Now the word strength there, uh, it speaks of valor. It's a thought of members of an army or the resources that they have as they march in the army. Girdeth simply means to belt or to bind about. So we are surrounded by strength. And that is the strength of the Lord. Now, we are in a battle, and that is very evident here. And we will be studying a little bit more about that in our next study as we go down through this passage. There's no doubt about it. The Christian is in a battle. But we are never asked to fight in our own strength or to stand in our own strength because we are strengthened by the Lord. In Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And if we truly grasped this, then what strength we would enjoy. If I can do all things when I'm strengthened by Christ, and if he has said I can do nothing without him, then it naturally flows that I should be often at his feet, praying for the strength that I need. Friend, he will not withhold the strength that I need, but we do know that often we have not because we ask not. Is weakness of the believer because of the lack of God? No, a thousand times, no. The Lord is willing to give strength. The Lord is willing to give power. But when a believer lives in their own power and their own strength and they neglect the word of God and they neglect the place of prayer and they neglect the house of God and they neglect going through with God, then they will fail. But that's no lack on God's part. That's because they have failed to seek him and live in his power. Oh, the importance of meeting with the Lord in the morning and throughout the day. But if we uh, just look at another verse where this word uh, strength is used, if you turn to Proverbs chapter 31, uh, verse number 10, it asks the question, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And that word virtuous is the same word which is translated strength in Psalm 18. And here it is speaking of a spiritual woman, a lady who is strong in the Lord, who puts Christ first. And we go down that list, and it gives us some practical examples of who this lady is and how she lives and her standards and her principles. And friend, to live in this way in a godly manner for a lady is to be called virtuous or to be strong in the Lord. And that's what we need in this land. We need women who are virtuous, who are godly, who are Christ-like. Sadly, today, the world promotes a woman who can live uh, promiscuity and immorality. And if things happen that they don't like, well, then they can just go to a clinic. Friend, that is not godliness. That's not godliness. And therefore, we have heard here David talks about 
being having the Lord as a strength, so there's a strong man. And then we talk about the virtuous woman, there's the godly woman. But don't forget, boys and girls, young people, teenagers, God wants us to be strong too. Or God wants you to be strong too. In First Samuel 16, verse 18, one of the servants answered Saul and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty, valiant man, a man of war and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. That same word, valiant, and you know, David was valiant. David was a young man. David was a teenager. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. That was his testimony. Teenager, boy and girl, is that your testimony? That the Lord is with you because you love the Lord and you obey the Lord and you follow the Lord. David wasn't strong in himself, but he was strong in the Lord. Remember in 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. David wasn't old enough to join the army, uh, but he was old enough to serve in God's army. He was old enough to be strong for the Lord. He knew the Lord. He prayed to the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. He sang to the Lord. He proved the Lord as a young man, as a youth, as a teenager. And therefore, I say to you, uh, young boy, young girl, teenager, person, maybe even in their 20s, don't think I have to be older to serve the Lord. I have to be older to be serious about God. I have to be older to be someone who walks with God. No, you do it now. Go through with God now. If you're saved, you follow the Lord all the way and the Lord will richly and greatly bless you. So here we have the first thing that the Lord does. The Lord gives strength to his people, to the men, to the woman, to the children. There's none left out. There's none insignificant in the eyes of the Lord. And indeed, a young person, a youth, can sometimes be more obedient to the Lord than older ones. But we're so thankful that there's strength for us all, for the old and for the young in Christ. Verse 32 continues to say, and he maketh my way perfect. Now, the word maketh means a gift to give, but it's translated many ways. For example, it's translated appointed or directed or ordained. And the word perfect means entire or upright or truth. And there's two thoughts here. First of all, in salvation, God gives us his righteousness, his gift to us is righteousness. And that's what the word perfect means, something that's upright. And therefore, it says, he maketh my way perfect, or he giveth unto me his righteousness. And that's the only way we can say that we're saved. And it's the only way that we can say that we're accepted by God. And we are traveling on the paths of righteousness to heaven because he has made us worthy to walk on that narrow road. But in another angle, as we think about life's journey and its twists and its turns, and sometimes our waywardness and our foolish directions, God gifts to us and gives us the gift of his word, his law, his holiness in the Bible. And through that gift, he directs us and blesses us by showing us the truth. And when we follow the word of God and the God of the word, then we will walk in the perfect way. And we can see that in verse 32. He maketh my way perfect. How? Through his teaching, through his word. You see, God's truth always brings us back to the center of God's will. And David is speaking here about fellowship with God. About a life that is surrendered unto the Lord. And he knows that he is in the right place with God at this time. He knows he's in the center of God's will. A hot, precious, and wonderful thing to be able to say that. And that's one of the great fears of the backslider. One of the awful fears of the backslider. Where should I be? What should I be doing? What life, or what would life be like now if I was right with the Lord? Oh, friend, keep close to the Lord. He maketh my way perfect. He shows in his word the right way to go. And when I go through with God and I obey him and I surrender to him, then I will walk a perfect way. I will walk the way of the upright. 
Keep close to the Lord. Remember, there's none other upon whom we can depend. Then it says in verse number 33, He maketh my feet like hinds' feet. Now, the hind is a female deer and was noted in the day for her swiftness and her swift, quick reactions. One of the Bible commentators, Gill, says, This may be understood in the spiritual sense of the readiness and cheerfulness with which the saints run the ways of God's commandment, that as soon as they hear, they obey. As soon as they hear, they go. They're ready and at once engaged to come and do the will of God. But not only is it important to be able to run for God, but it's also important to be able to run from sin. Running for God and running from sin. And you can see the deer out in the field. And maybe the hunter's coming and the danger's coming and she knows that there's going to be trouble. And as soon as she hears the noise, watch it, she flies away. She doesn't say to investigate. She knows it's dangerous. Friend, that ought to be the way we deal with sin. As soon as we get the whiff of sin, as soon as we have awareness of sin, as soon as we hear of sin, friend, we ought to be swift and fly away like the deer or the hind running for her life. But not only are we to be able to run for God in obedience, from sin, again in obedience, but there are times we ought to be able to run after the enemy and charge after sin, say no, and pray against Satan, and pray against the powers of wickedness, and pray against those uh, movements in this world that are wrong. And in doing so, we run toward the enemy in the strength of the Lord. And the Lord gives us power and enablement to do all these things. And then it says also in verse 33 that he setteth me upon my high places. And simply that means God gives him security and makes him safe from danger. And the safest place for you to be is in the center of the will of God. There's no more safe place for you to be. Now we have already looked at the Lord as our security and as our high tower in this psalm already. And when we are in danger, we can flee to Christ. And we have the safety of his arms, the safety of his covenant, the safety of his blessings, the safety of his promises. Hymn writer says, where could I go but to the Lord? There's a hymn that was written not that long ago, and I just want to read the words to you, and I think it's wonderful. This is talking about the Lord protecting us. I run to Christ when chased by fear and find a refuge sure. Believe in me, his voice I hear his words and wounds secure. I run to Christ when torn by grief and find abundant peace. I too had tears, he gently speaks, thus joy and sorrow meets. I run to Christ when worn by life and I find my soul refreshed. Come on to me, he calls through strife. Fatigue gives way to rest. I run to Christ when vexed by hell. And find a mighty arm. The devil flees, the scripture tells. He roars, but cannot harm. I run to Christ when stalked by sin. And find a sure escape. Deliver me, I cry to him. Temptation yields to grace. I run to Christ when plagued by shame. And find my one defense. I bore God's wrath. He pleads my cause my advocate and friend. Oh, in the day of trouble, in the day of sorrow, in the day of fear, in the day of guilt, run to Christ. Run to Christ. And then verse 34, it says, He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. It is lawful to battle against the enemies of the soul. And the Lord calls us to be soldiers in the battle. Not to sit on the sidelines, but to be engaged. We serve under Christ, and we're equipped by Christ. The armor of God is provided. The strategies are revealed in the word, and there is no reason why each believer ought not to be engaged in the battle. Now, if you notice here, David is speaking of a strength that is unusual. 
And this is exactly what David, or what the Lord equips his people with, a supernatural strength. And whenever the battle is raging, and whenever we're facing sin and temptation, God will give us the power when we depend on him and when we call on him. It's a supernatural strength. Yes, it's as if the bow of temptation, the bow of steel is uh, pointed at David, but David goes over and David breaks it. How does he do it? In the power of God. And if we depend upon our own self, we will never, never, never say no to temptation. But God can give us grace to say no, to break the temptation, to cause the devil to flee. There is nothing that can stand against the strength of the Lord and prevail. There is nothing that can stand against the strength of the Lord and prevail. And God can use ordinary people who are surrendered to him to be endued with supernatural strength to do great things for the cause of Christ. What great things can we do for the cause of Christ? Well, I believe the greatest thing we can do is to pray. There is no greater battle. And what a battle it is. But we're strongest when we pray. There's victory when we pray. The devil will do everything to keep us from praying because he knows it's a place of blessing and spiritual success. We need victory to say no to sin, only God's power can overcome temptation. We need strength to say yes to God and only God's power and strength can give us grace to say, here I am, Lord. We need power and strength to stand fast upon the principles of God's word when all the world around us seems to be moving away and only God's power can cause us to stand fast. In Daniel 11, verse 32, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And again, mark the relationship and closeness with the Lord that results in blessing. They that know the Lord shall be strong and do exploits. Sadly, today in our land, uh, this week's laws have been passed that are completely contrary to the word of God. My friend, if we take time to think about those laws those abortion laws, and we take time to actually consider what they mean. It ought to grieve the heart of anyone who's a human heart within their chest. But friend, I'm telling you, there is no land that goes against God and prospers. There's no people that goes against God and prospers. And there's no government that goes against God and prospers. And the bottom line is that this has gone completely in the face of God and a complete defiance of Scripture. And friend, God will not be mocked. And I fear what God will do to deal with our land, how far we've fallen away from him. Right is wrong today. Wrong is right. And friend, we need a people who are going to stand on the principles of the word of God. A people who are going to speak truth no matter the cost. We believe with all our hearts that this is wrong. And we are going to pray that the Lord will step in and reverse it. But friend, we ought to be very sorrowful today because our land has just made a declaration that the word of God means absolutely nothing anymore. And they've turned their back on the very principles of the basic necessities of life. And may God deal with the hearts of our government at this time. Verse 35, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. And you know the Lord is our shield. On the cross of Calvary, Rather than the, the wrath of God being poured out upon us, the Lord stood in our place. He stood between me and the Father. And he bore the wrath of God for me. He suffered the punishment that I deserved. And then we have to ask ourselves, how many times has the Lord stood between the children and the fiery darts of the wicked one? How many times has the Lord protected me from the attacks of Satan? Friend, we will never know, I believe, until eternity reveals the full extent of the protection of God for his people. 
the arms of God ever around us, the shield of God encircling us, the hands of God protecting us. And then some people have the audacity to say, where is God? Friend, God is protecting his people. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. Don't let your heart get so cold, believer, as you start to question where God is. God's where he's promised to be, with you, watching over you. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And he cannot and he will not fail. Get back to the word and read until you understand and realize and believe that God is doing exactly what he has promised to do. And then it says in verse 35, thy right hand hath holden me up. And the right hand, of course, is the hand of strength. And we know that there are many times in life we fall, but the Lord does not allow us to fall out of our salvation or to fall out of grace. Yes, we fall along life's journey, but he holds us up. He holds us up. And he will never allow us to lose our salvation. We thank God for that. We are eternally secure. And then we come to thy gentleness hath made me great. And whenever we read that particular verse the word gentleness means favor goodness and kindness favor goodness and kindness and it's from a word which means humble and weak and meek and lowly there are two thoughts here firstly David realizes that the blessings of his life are because of the goodness of God He pours out his favor and his grace and his mercy upon his children. There are blessings when we realize that they're from the hand of God. And if we look at our lives and see what God has done for us, we will be overwhelmed. Every step of the journey of the Lord will bless us. A person may not have much of what this world defines as riches, But when he or she can meet every day with God to worship him, to read about him, to pray to him, to leave their needs and their cares before him, to ask for guidance and for grace in the hours ahead, then that person is spiritually great, spiritually rich, living in the abundance and in the blessings and in the plenty of God. And that's what this is talking about. Thy gentleness or thy favor or thy goodness has made me great spiritually and praise God because of his favor upon his children we are richly blessed but remembering that the root word of the word gentleness means humility we cannot pass over this little phrase without stating that the greatest need and the greatest blessing that man could receive is that of salvation and notice how and why salvation is freely offered to us because our Lord humbled himself And that gentleness speaks to us of our Lord becoming man. And the meekness of our Lord humbling himself. The one who's worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Who will be eternally worshipped by the company of the redeemed humbled himself. Became a man. Made a little lower than the angels. Came to die upon Calvary. To take upon him that body of flesh eternally and he humbled himself, why? To make us great. To lift us up. To give us the abundance of his blessing. Friend, the only reason any Christian is worthy of heaven, the only reason we can approach God, the only reason that we can rejoice in our standing in Christ today is because Christ humbled himself. And took upon him flesh and came to this world to die on the cross for sinners. And we can truly say his gentleness, his meekness, his humility, his coming down has lifted us up. Friend, we're nothing without Christ. We're no ones without Christ before God and our sin. We're worthy of nothing but eternal punishment in hell, but clothed in his righteousness and washed in his blood, we're made worthy to stand as the children of God. And that is the ultimate measure of greatness. You ask this world, what makes someone great today? And they'll say money or 
power or wisdom or success. No, you read the word of God. What makes a person great? The blood of Christ. Because it brings, us into the, brings them into the greatest blessing. It relieves the greatest burden. And it gives them the greatest prospect of an eternity in heaven. Friend, the greatest thing we are able to say in this world is to say, I am saved by the grace of God. And I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then finally, verse number 36. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me. And whenever we read the word of God, and whenever you read, especially in the Old Testament, whenever the writers, and often they do in Hebrew, are writing poetically, they talk about the person's condition in life by their steps or by their goings. And whenever it speaks about the narrow or the straightened steps, that signifies great distress or great affliction. But when it talks about the large place or the large steps and the unconfined steps, then it's talking about prosperity and plenty. And therefore, when it talks about someone able to walk well and able to make great advancement, it's talking about prosperity and plenty. And therefore, I believe that in this verse 36, that was enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. I believe that that is teaching us that God gives us freedom to walk with him. You see, we are not able as sinners to walk with God. It's impossible. You can read the Bible, you can pray, and you can go to church. But friend, that's not walking with God. That's not walking with God. You cannot walk with God unless you're saved. When you're saved by the grace of God, when your sins are washed away, and you've asked the Lord to cleanse your life, then you're walking with God. You see, obedience brings great freedom to walk with God. Now, David, remember, was concerned about his enemies. He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord answered his cry. Now, did the Lord take his enemies away? No, because those enemies would come against him again. There would be times whenever those enemies attacked him again. Those would, that, that would not be the last threat of danger that David knew in his life. But God dealt with his heart. And while the enemies remained, it didn't matter because his heart was right with God. The Lord had taken away the fear and given him grace to continue his walk with God. And the enemies outside the castle walls could not restrict David from walking with God inside the castle walls. And sometimes people make excuses about not going on or going through with God. I'm too busy. I have too many troubles in my life. I have too many disappointments. I'm weary. And whatever you can fill in there as your excuse for not going on or going through with God. But I am asking you and I'm begging you as a pastor of this congregation, don't let anything hinder you from walking with God. Don't let anything hinder you from a closer walk with God. Because, friend, that's why he saved you. Nothing else will satisfy. Nothing else will take the place. Friend, the thing that will truly bring blessing to the Christian's heart is closer walk with God. And it says, I was enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. And you know, whenever you're walking with God, then there's stability. There's stability. What do we need in today's society? We need people who are going to be stable, stable Christians, walking in maturity, in accordance with the word of God. And I'll tell you, should the whole world around you mock and ridicule and go their own way, whenever you go through with God, you'll be able to say, Thank you for the freedom you've given me to walk with thee. Oh, may the Lord grant today that each believer will be able to look down this list of things, verse 32 to 36, knowing what the Lord can do. And pray down every verse and say, Lord, may this be a reality in my life. 
Lord, I surrender all that I might know this walk with God. I pray, O Lord, that you'll help me to live according to this book, that my life will count for eternity. May God grant it. For his name's sake, and maybe you're not saved. If you ask the question, what's the point of life? How can I be sure of heaven? How can I know peace with God? And the answer is in verse number 32. It is God. He is the answer. Turning from your sin and trusting in him. Calling for cleansing in the blood. Friend, you'll know salvation full and free. May God grant that today, even to those who are not saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the privilege of opening thy word. And how, Lord, our hearts have been thrilled when we realize how great and how good our God is. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless us, keep us faithful as the people of God, as the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, oh, have mercy in our land. Have mercy in our land. While there's regulations have been passed this week that have brought us great rejoicing, Lord, there's regulations that have been passed this week and have brought us great distress. And so-called advanced civilization with all their wisdom and knowledge, decrying that it's legal to murder a little child within the womb. Oh, Father, have mercy. Have mercy. Bring guilt and conviction upon the souls that campaign for such wickedness. And raise up a standard again that these laws will be turned back Laws that do not bring glory to thee. O oh, Father, blow upon this land, we pray. Shake us up, we ask. And may God be glorified in the days that lie ahead. Bless the people of God. Help us to be faithful. For we ask in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen and amen. Final hymn that we're going to listen to. I've cast my heavy burden down on Canaan's happy shore. I'm living where the healing waters flow. Join us tonight in the will of the Lord at 7 p.m. But until then, listen to this beautiful hymn. Let's stand and sing.